for I dipped into the future, far as the human eye could see. Saw a vision of the world and the wonder that it would be, till the war drums throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man, the federation of the world. There the common sense of most shall hold a fretful realm in awe, and the kindly earth shall slumber, lapped in universal law. Now these are some of the oft-quoted lines from the poem Loxie Hall written in 1837 by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And these portray a concept that's been there since centuries, the concept of global governance. That's also implicit in the Charter of United Nations, which begins with the words, we the peoples of United Nations. The United Nations is an organization that's for the people of the international community, that works for us. And that's the very topic that I'm going to talk about today, whether the United Nations is a failed reality or a beacon of hope. Since the advent of time, there has been many major regime changes, socio-political changes, socio-economic changes, and even cultural changes. Alexander the Great extended Greek hegemony over much of the world. This was followed by Roman dominance. After several centuries, after the fall of the Ro Pax Romana, which was caused by influx of bar barbarian hordes into the weakened empire, there was the British Empire, which at a point of time, hold about 23.84% of the world. There was the Mongolian Empire, which was the largest contiguous land empire in world history. The Middle Ages, as we know from the intriguing material vestiges of that era. Battlemented fortresses and castles and almost made war a way of life for the rulers of the Western world, who acting through a allied feudal system, affected much of the socio-economic fabric of that time. The European Renaissance pierced through the obscurity of the Dark Ages and did much to illumine the human spirit, but it did nothing to dispel the ugly shadows of war. In the century prior to the creation of the UN, there were several international organizations and international treaty conferences as formed, such as the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, the International Committee of the Red Cross in 1863, or the first embryonic world parliament, which was formed by William Hendel Kremer and Frederick Passy. Following the horrendous loss of life in First World War, the Paris Peace Conference through the Treaty of Versailles established the League of Nations. When the League of Nations was established, one point of contention was Article 10 of the Covenant of League of Nations. Now, Article 10 mentioned it necessary that for all members had to provide military aid to the League when the League so authorizes it to be for protecting the territorial integrity or the political independence of any member whose political independence is at jeopardy. However, according to the US Constitution, only the US Congress has the right to declare war, whether America is in war or not, or whether America sends foreign troops to a foreign land or not. Sends troops to a foreign land or not. So this article was directly in con contradiction to the US Constitution. The United States Senate, the United States Congress uh, proposed certain reservations to the covenant, to the Article 10 of the covenant. However, the League never agreed to that, which is why, though the League of Nations was something that was formulated out of President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, since the US Senate never ratified the Covenant of League of Nations, the United States government never joined the League of Nations. But the provision got ratified, of course. Secondly, because the founders of the United Nations, for most part, they desired to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And they believed that it was necessary to, for actual suppression of acts of aggression, rather than opposition to or simply condemnation of such acts, as was mentioned in the Covenant of League of Nations. Now, they, for most part, had seen people, dictators like Kaiser and Hitler. They knew that if a superpower like Kaiser, if a superpower like United States would have intervened into these wars, these wars wouldn't have exacerbated, or these wars might not have taken in the first place. If Kaiser would have known that US would intervene, he might not have altered with Belgian neutrality, or if um, Hitler would have known that US would intervene, for the same reason he wouldn't have entered Rhineland. So they, they believed, they strongly believed that it was ne necessary to mention in the UN Charter that there needs to be actual suppression of acts of aggression, and which led to the guiding principles of the UN Charter. In fact, uh, since World War II, all discussions that has taken place in multilateral forums, it has respected the process of national sovereignty as uh, defined by Montevideo Convention or Westphalian Peace Treaty of 1646, and also the, uh, has respected constitutional processes. In fact, NATO and Warsaw Pact made it very clear that parties need to carry out provisions of Cold War in accordance with constitutional processes. 
The role of United Nations over the past 73 years of its existence has been quite constructive and helpful. For example, it has carried out withdrawal of foreign troops in Iran in 1947, established its first peacekeeping mission in Suez in 1956, which also carried out ceasefires and truces in the Suez region, carried, installed a US force, a UN force in Gaza Strip and the Gulf of Aqaba region in 1957, which actually converted the Palestine region for a period of about 10, 15 years from being overtly explosive to relatively quiet. And it also arranged for ceasefires and truces in Indonesia in 1947-48, in Kashmir in 1948, and in Congo and Cyprus in 1964. There has also been efforts of the United States, uh, of the United Nations to release UN Korean War prisoners held in mainland China, or to authorize a UN resolution uh, for sanctioning a US-led coalition to repeal the North Korean invasion on South Korea in 1950. In fact, this is a very prominent example that's still discussed within the hallowed halls of UN, because it was a time when the USSR was boycotting the meetings of the Security Council because it wanted the People's Republic of China to become a member of the Council, which at that point of time was Taiwanese government or the Republic of China. So this has become quite a prominent example of Security Council taking a very important decision without the presence of a permanent member. There have been other examples of successful UN action as well. In fact, there has been times when the United Nations has not acted but still it proved to be useful for maintaining international peace and security. In 1958, for example, when the government of Lebanon was in the, was in the face of an imminent danger of being subverted, sabotaged by individuals who were being paid, directed and equipped from outside the country, then US President Eisenhower, to obviate the event, to forestall the event, sent US troops to the region, to the, Le uh, to the region of Lebanon with the permission of the gov government of Lebanon in the month of June that year and withdrew the troops in September that year after the subversion was averted. Now this was done to censure the United States in the United Nations. However, just before the vote was about to take place in the General Assembly, the motion of the sponsor withdrew the motion because he realized, because the country realized that it wouldn't be able to muster enough votes in the General Assembly. But if this motion would have passed, then we could have seen other attempts of such subversion at being attempted by smaller states, which would have been very detrimental to international peace and security. So the United Nations played a very decisive role in this regard. There has been other examples of successful UN action as well, such as um, establishing a large military presence in Congo to restore uh, order to the breakaway state of Katanga. In fact, Dag Hammarskjöld, the former Secretary General, lost his life uh, when he was en route to Congo to solve the crisis there. And in fact, uh, the Congo military operation of UN was one of the largest military operations of its early decades. There is also establishment of arms control, promotion of international law and ushering former colonies into the world of sovereign states. The United States also played a decisive role in bringing an end to the Salvadorian civil war or uh, to, uh, to oversee the democratic elections in post-apartheid South Africa or post khema Rouge Cambodia or um, as it so usefully did during the Gulf crisis. Now, the United Nations over the past decades has played the role of uh, a center of being quite diplomacy. It has become a training school for diplomats from all over the world. If there is a will to harmonize, it provides a center and a staff for the people, for the diplomats to resolve that crisis, as it so usefully did in the Gulf crisis in 1991. In fact, after being paralyzed for decades because of the Cold War tensions, the Security Council suddenly burst onto the scene in 1991 and started passing resolutions condemning the regime of Saddam Hussein. The United Nations has also played a very useful role in economic and social development arena, which is one of its secondary goals. Over the past five years, it has administered over $1.2 billion in development aid, another $2.4 billion in follow-up funds for the received countries, so a total of $4.2 billion in development aid for the, for the countries to build up their capacity to build up their social economic infrastructure. The Bretton Woods institutions that was also formed at the same time as the UN, which are specialized agencies of the UN system, such as the World Bank Group or the International Monetary Fund, even they have been helpful. And in fact, over the past 10 years, they have loaned over $20 billion to these countries, which is a new high for the Bretton Woods institutions. And this, of course, takes into account the uh, basic necessities such as food, shelter, medicine, education, and other economic necessities. So such is the record of the UN in a capsule form, the mammoth record of the UN in a capsule form. Little of it would have happened if not for the United Nations. All the agencies of the UN, all the 26 specialized agencies, funds and programs, research institutes, have made the world a better place to live in. 
a better place than it was yesterday after the um, aftermath of the World War II and World War I. Yet, there has been opinion polls which show that there has been a sharp decline for support of the United Nations and unfortunately so since 1958, uh, since 1998 and it says that there has been a sharp decline from 82% to 58%. People believe that the achievements of the UN do not counterbalance the many follies that, ha that it has or the failures of its peacekeeping missions on ground such as the failure of its peacekeeping mission, uh, of its peacekeeping mission getting indulged in sexual violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In fact, Americans believe that the United Nations did nothing to end the Vietnam War or that the words of the Charter of Suppression of Acts of Aggression is just a dead letter or that voting in the UN does not correspond to the ability of carrying out the measures that's being voted upon or that there is an alarming tendency to consider a question not on the basis of merits but on the basis of blocks, to vote as blocks. An initiative which might quite dangerously and quite effectively pulverize support in the UN for various uh, regional groupings. And there have been other petty annoyances as well. And one of the most important concerns of the UN recently for many Secretary Generals over the past uh, 20 years has been the member states, powerful member states, not paying its share of expenses to the UN. Other petty annoyances such as the lateness in starting of meetings or the windiness of the oratory or um, uh, the windiness of the oratory or uh, the general lack of relevance in the much to lend the so-called debates. In fact, I can recount one experience. I happened to be to uh, UN headquarters in New York last year and I was going to the UN, I took a cab and uh, the cab driver asked me like, why am I going to the UN? And I told him that, you know, I'm going for a model UN conference and he was like, oh, that's another bullshit that America takes part in. So that, that's the view that Americans unfortunately hold of the United Nations, but then the UN is walking uh, through its various departments to outdo that uh, view that the Americans or people all over the world hold about the UN. There have been other uncomplimentary things told about the United Nations as well, such as when the United Nations, and these are quite unexpected, such as when the United Nations bears pressure on a nation and the pressure is effective, the nation resents it. But when the United Nations doesn't do anything, it appears to be preposterous and farcical. So basically, as one distinguished American pointed out, and I was reading this in an article by an essayist, a famous essayist, that the United Nations is a do-it-yourself kit with all the pieces missing. But then that's the way the contemporary geopolitical relations work. Uh, but there has been talks about reforms of the United Nations since the late 1990s. Uh, there has been talks about uh, reforming the highest stage of world diplomacy, which is the Security Council. There have been proposals by G4, by UFC of another category of membership. And there has also been proposals of reforming the working methods of Security Council. And uh, then there has been uh, talks about reforming the membership of Human Rights Council or dealing with the, uh, the way the General Assembly works or the Economic and Social Council works, doing away with the Trusteeship Council as per the reports of In Larger Freedom by Kofi Annan, former Secretary General and also uh, dealing with the re revitalization of the military staff committee which is the only subsidiary body established by the UN Charter. But there, ha there has been lots of proposals uh, by member states or by think tanks, NGOs about how to reform the UN. But there has been no real negotiation. Basically all hats and no cattle. But uh, fortunately in 2015 the United Nations adopted an intergovernmental process on text based negotiations which provides a way ahead and which is surely a beacon of hope. And in fact, in 2016, for the first time in the history of the organization, the election of the Secretary General was carried out by public debates where the ca candidates for secretaryship had to um, lay out what their plans are for reforming the UN or for reforming other, for working on other aspects of United Nations. In fact, it in a way did away with the papal sort of election that the Secretary General had where all the election was done in closed doors and it resembled the way the Pope is selected in Vatican where we can only know how the Pope is selected by the brown fume or the white fume on the top of the Vatican. Uh, so there has been talks but there has been no real negotiation. However, we believe that uh, we can work on that. And uh, so there, the United Nations is not the end to itself. It's a means to an end. It's not the sole, piece, uh, sole instrument for maintaining global peace. There are many regional organizations. In fact, in the recent years, the, United, uh, the European Union has been coordinating actively with the, uh, with the United Nations. The EU, in fact, has an enhanced observer status in the General Assembly. There is, uh, there is recently the United Nations joined, uh, launched a joint hybrid operation with the African Union in Darfur to solve the crisis in South Sudan. 
since the late 1900s this process of cooperating with the since the late 1990s this process of cooperating with regional organizations has started uh, and it started with war in afghanistan in 2001 when though the security council was the one to authorize a us led invasion but it was actually overseen and carried out by nato so the united nations is simply uh, uh, the best hope that we have for maintaining peace and security for giving uh, for the best hope for mankind and the united nations though has not stopped conflicts but it has at least prevented them from becoming bigger ones. And as former Secretary General Dag Hamakshjol had rightly pointed out, the United Nations was not created to take mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. So parliamentary diplomacy has rightly proved its worth. The United Nations makes a difference between life and death. If not for the United Nations, we wouldn't have been in such a stable world. Not effectively stable, but at least stable than what it was before. So rather than criticizing it, I believe that we must work towards reforming it, towards invigorating it, towards modernizing it, and make of it what diplomats call to be a power fact. Something that the governments must recognize with, must recon with, and something that is an effective tool, which though not a panache, but at least may, uh, may, may prevent the world from getting worse, or even take a chance in making it better. And as, again, former Secretary General Dag Hamakshjol had pointed out, everything will be all right. You know when? When the people, just people, stop thinking of UN as a weird Picasso abstraction and think it of a drawing that they made themselves. And as Norman Cousins rightly pointed out, if the United Nations is to survive, those who represent it must bolster it. Those who advocate it must submit to it. And those who believe in it must fight for it. Thank you so much.